Positive pressure ventilation can have both beneficial and adverse physiologic effects. Let's find out what they are. Hello there and welcome to my YouTube channel. If this is your first time here and you want more of this content, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below and if you hit the bell, you'll get notified whenever I release more content. So, during normal spontaneous breathing, intrathoracic pressure is negative throughout the ventilatory cycle. Intrapleural pressure varies from about minus five centimeters of water during exhalation to minus eight centimeters of water during inhalation. Alveolar pressure fluctuates from plus one centimeters of water during exhalation to minus one centimeter of water during inhalation. This decrease in intrapleural pressure during inhalation facilitates both lung inflation and venous return. Pressure fluctuations during positive pressure ventilation are opposite to those that occur during spontaneous breathing. As a consequence, intrathoracic pressure increases during inhalation and decreases during exhalation. Venous return, therefore, is greatest during exhalation and may be decreased if expiratory time is too short or mean alveolar pressure too high. Mean airway pressure is one of the key factors we need to understand. This is the average pressure applied to the airway during the ventilatory cycle. So, what are some of the pulmonary effects of mechanical ventilation? Shunt is blood flow without ventilation. Pulmonary shunt occurs when blood flows from the right heart to the left heart without participating in gas exchange. This results in hypoxemia. Capillary shunt results when blood flows past unventilated alveoli, and this can occur during atelectasis, pneumonia, pulmonary edema, and acute respiratory distress syndrome. Normal anatomical shunt occurs due to the Thebesian veins and bronchial circulation. Positive pressure ventilation usually decreases shunt, and inspiratory pressure that exceeds the alveolar opening pressure will expand the collapsed alveolus, and also an expiratory pressure greater than alveolar closing pressure prevents its collapse. This maintains recruitment. A relative shunt effect can occur with poor distribution of ventilation, such as occurs in airway disease. With such poor distribution, some alveoli are underventilated relative to perfusion, whereas other alveoli are overventilated. Positive pressure ventilation may improve the distribution of ventilation. Tidal volume is the amount of gas inhaled or exhaled with a single breath. A minute ventilation is the volume of gas breathed in one minute. Minute ventilation is the product of tidal volume and respiratory frequency. Ventilation can be either dead space ventilation or alveolar ventilation. Minute ventilation is the sum of dead space ventilation and alveolar ventilation. Alveolar ventilation takes part in gas exchange, but dead space ventilation does not. Dead space is ventilation without perfusion. There is an anatomic dead space in the lungs of approximately 150 mils. Mechanical dead space refers to the rebreathed volume of the ventilator circuit and acts as an extension of the anatomic dead space. The anatomic dead space is a fixed volume, so low tidal volume increases the dead space fraction and decreases alveolar ventilation. An increased dead space fraction will require a greater minute ventilation to maintain alveolar ventilation. Atelectasis is where regions of the lung collapse and is a common complication of mechanical ventilation. It can be as a result of preferential ventilation of non-dependent lung zones, the weight of the lungs causing compression of dependent regions, or of airway obstruction. 100% oxygen can also produce absorption atelectasis. Use of PEEP is effective in preventing atelectasis. Barotrauma is alveolar rupture due to over distension. This can lead to a pneumothorax, which can progress rapidly to a life-threatening tension pneumothorax. Ventilator-induced lung injury can be caused by alveolar over-distension. The peak alveolar pressure should ideally be as low as possible and certainly less than 30 centimeters of water. Over-distension is minimized by limiting tidal volumes to 4 to 8 mils per kilo, ideal body weight for example. Ventilator lung injury can also be as a result of the opening and closing of the alveoli. This can be helped by 
the application of PEEP. Promoting alveolar over distension and derecruitment can cause inflammation in the lungs and translocation of inflammatory mediators. Ventilator associated pneumonia can occur as a result of mechanical ventilation. This most often results from aspiration of oral pharyngeal secretions around the cuff. Hyperventilation will lower the PaCO2, which increases arterial pH. This alkalosis can cause hyperkalemia, decreased ionized calcium, and increased affinity for hemoglobin for oxygen. In other words, a left shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Relative hyperventilation can occur when mechanical ventilation is provided for patients with chronic compensated respiratory acidosis. If a normal PaCO2 is established, then the result is an elevated pH. It is commonly recommended that an FiO2 of greater than 60% should be avoided, particularly if breathed for a period of more than 48 hours. High inspired oxygen concentration is considered toxic. Mechanical ventilation could also have some cardiac effects in that it can decrease cardiac output resulting in hypertension and potential tissue hypoxia. Oxemia. Positive pressure ventilation may also increase pulmonary vascular resistance. The increasing alveolar pressure, particularly with PEEP, has a constricting effect on the pulmonary vasculature. This increase in resistance decreases left ventricular filling and cardiac output. Consequently, right ventricular afterload can increase resulting in right ventricular hypertrophy. These effects can be ameliorated by lower mean airway pressure. The decrease in cardiac output can also affect the kidneys, resulting in decreased renal perfusion. Fluid overload frequently occurs during mechanical ventilation due to decreased urine output, excessive intravenous fluid administration, and elimination of insensible water loss from the respiratory tract due to the humidification of the inspired gas. Patients being mechanically ventilated may also develop gastric distension, and appropriate nutritional support can be problematic. In patients with head injuries, positive pressure ventilation might increase intracranial pressure. Delirium is also common in mechanically ventilated patients. There are many proposals as to how we can reduce this level of delirium in our patients, including the ABCDEF bundle. Mechanically ventilated patients are also at risk of critical illness-induced weakness, and if the respiratory muscles are not used, ventilator-induced diaphragm dysfunction can occur. Early mobilization of the ventilated patient is used increasingly to address this problem. Mechanically ventilated patients are also at risk of complications of having an endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube, such as laryngeal edema, tracheal mucosal trauma, or contamination of the lower respiratory tract. Sleep can be difficult for the patient who is mechanically ventilated. They will not have normal sleep patterns, and this deprivation can produce delirium, patient ventilator asynchrony, and sedation-induced ventilator dependency. Finally, there may be a lack of synchrony between the breathing efforts of the patient and the ventilator. This can be caused by incorrect settings of the ventilator, or pain, anxiety, and acidosis in the patient. I hope you find these videos useful. I've got more on mechanical ventilation. Please go and look. And in the meantime, subscribe to the channel. Thank you.